Earlier this year, we shared part two of our video series all about slowly but surely constructing our garden fence. Now, I say slowly because this project originally started back in 2016. And I say surely because we're still at it five years later. And so today, I'd like to present part three. But if you missed the previous two installments, I really do recommend that you watch them first, because they discuss our motivations, thought processes, and personal garden philosophies that all led us to this particular solution. In the interest of time, I'll be skipping over many of those details in this episode. However, as usual, I'll still provide a really quick recap as both an overview of our plan and a reminder of where we left off. So the first part, published toward the end of 2019, was all about our garden layout and the installation of our fence posts. In it, we covered the dimensions of our beds, the reasoning behind our choices, and even the math of mapping out a perfect square on your land. We also talked about why we used cedar posts and how we set them in the ground without the use of cement. Then in part two, we covered our attempt at keeping the smaller digging animals out of our garden. And we threw in some protection against rhizomatous plants as well. To do this, we laid out a thick layer of cardboard, an L-shaped section of hardware cloth, another layer of cardboard, and then six inches of sawdust. The final result was not only a lower fence that's difficult to tunnel under, but also a six-foot perimeter of sheet mulching, which should deter even the most aggressive of invasive rhizomes. Now, in part three, aka this video, we'll talk about the larger animals like deer who don't really dig or climb, but if you say jump, they don't ask how high, because by then they've already cleared your fence and are now too busy eating all of your Brussels sprouts. And finally, next time in part four, we'll attempt to outsmart the problem-solving raccoons. Because not only can they devour an entire corn patch in a single evening, but they can also climb and solve puzzles. So that's the overall plan, but for right now, let's get back to the jumpers. From what we've read, and in our limited experience, when trying to keep deer out of your garden, height is far more important than strength. And that's mostly because deer are excellent jumpers, but not big on brute force. In fact, many people recommend simply installing some sort of deterrent, like single strands of wire, twine, fishing line, etc. Apparently, upon noticing this incredibly minor inconvenience, deer will just give up and find a food source somewhere else. Now, personally, I really like this idea. Because we're only protecting a garden, after all, so all we really need is the least amount of fence that will actually do the job. In fact, we tried a similar method a few years ago, by using some of this cheap deer netting that we picked up at the local hardware store. As you can see, we also tied small ribbons to the netting to make it more visible. These were both meant as a deterrent for the deer, and also as a reminder for us, because we quickly discovered that the netting was incredibly difficult to see, and therefore incredibly easy to walk into. Now, whether it worked or not is hard to say for sure, because it was only up for one season, and we didn't have another unfenced garden to compare it to. However, I can say that while it was up, our garden was never raided by deer even once. But that's the thing. It didn't stay up for very long. At least once our corn was ready. You see, though the inexpensive netting seemed to be an excellent deterrent for jumping animals, it was no match at all for our very healthy raccoon population. So as soon as the corn cobs were ready to be harvested, the nocturnal bandits effortlessly climbed the net and tore it to shreds under their weight, which left us with a gaping hole in our defenses and about four dozen fewer cobs for dinner. So that's when we first decided that something a bit more robust would be required. But I should also note that if deer are your only garden invaders, then the more minimalist approach might very well be sufficient. But that leads us to our hopefully final option, chicken wire. Now, if you're not familiar, chicken wire is basically just a mesh of thin wires that are twisted together to form a net of hexagonal holes, typically ranging from half inch to two inches in diameter. The individual wires are usually pretty thin, between 19 and 22 gauge, and either made of stainless steel or galvanized to increase its lifespan when exposed to the elements. The main disadvantages to this fencing material versus the cheap deer netting that we tried initially is that it's about double the price and it's a bit more difficult to work with. However, given the fact that the netting only lasted about five minutes once the raccoons got involved, the chicken wire should more than pay for itself almost immediately. And the hope is that we only have to replace it once or twice per decade, instead of every single season. So the extra bit of effort to install it will also be comparatively less when averaged out over its entire lifespan. Plus, throw in the fact that the deer netting is plastic and eventually destined for the landfill, and chicken wire, for us, became a no-brainer. 
As for dimensions, we decided to go with 1 inch chicken wire as a middle of the road option. It was cheaper and lighter than the half inch and provided a bit more protection from smaller animals than the 2 inch. If you recall, the lower section of our fence, which was intended to keep out small digging animals like rabbits, groundhogs, and mice, is made of quarter inch hardware cloth and only a foot and a half tall. That was because we wanted the greatest level of protection at and below the ground level in hopes of making it as difficult as possible for the smaller animals to dig or gnaw their way through. But as I mentioned in part two, most would recommend that the fence should be about two to three feet tall instead, as some rabbits can really jump and groundhogs are surprisingly good climbers. As a quick side note, please see the video about our resident family of groundhogs for more information about that. Anyway, we were comfortable with the shorter height for the lower fence because we knew that we'd be installing our upper fence next and together they would provide two layers of protection with the greatest strength right where it was needed. Now, I should mention that we could have used quarter inch hardware cloth all the way to the top. This would have undoubtedly provided an even greater level of impenetrability. But again, I'd rather aim for the least amount of fencing that will actually accomplish the goal. In fact, if I'm being really honest, I'd rather not have to install a fence at all, though I suppose the past five years of not finishing it might have already suggested that. We're usually trying to work with nature rather than against it, and nothing really contradicts that philosophy quite like a big metal fence telling most of nature to just stay away. But I'll save my wrestling with that inner conflict for another video. So for now, back to the chicken wire. Around here, most people seem to recommend a deer fence that's about seven or eight feet tall. And as mentioned, our lower fence was already a foot and a half. So that meant we needed to fill in a gap of about six and a half feet. The problem, however, is that chicken wire comes in various size rolls, but the largest we could find locally was only six feet tall. Six inches too short. So after considering a bunch of different configurations, we eventually decided to use four foot rolls and just double it up. This would both fill in the gap and leave enough extra for overlaps. Then since our garden is 50 by 50, we once again chose to go with rolls that were 50 feet long, two per side for a total of eight any shorter and we would have to join them together in the middle of each side, and any longer would have been unnecessarily difficult to work with. Actually installing the fencing was a simple matter of rolling it out, holding it up, and stapling it onto each post. However, we immediately ran into a problem, because as you can see, our first roll was just a bit too short, and at least one of us found that to be rather frustrating. But after measuring the roll and comparing it to the others, we eventually realized that it was actually a problem with stretching. You see, due to the twisted mesh design, you can easily increase the dimensions in one direction by decreasing the dimensions in the other, and vice versa. So in our case, by accidentally stretching the height, we inadvertently compressed the length. So to remedy this, we first removed the chicken wire and then temporarily stapled a four foot piece of scrap wood to one end, then unrolled it and did the same to the other. This let us stretch all the kinks out of the wire while also maintaining a consistent four foot width from one end to the other, and therefore allowed us to utilize the entire 50 foot length. Plus, as an unintended side benefit, it also made the lifting and attaching quite a bit easier as well. Then, once the section was complete, we simply removed the pieces of wood and moved on to the next side. Now repeat three more times and our fence was suddenly five and a half feet tall. Oh, but before we continue, I should also mention that when we stapled on the first layer, we overlapped the chicken wire and hardware cloth by about three inches so that we could eventually sew them together. More on that in a moment. But rather than measuring at each post, we simply counted the holes in the mesh since each are supposed to be an inch in diameter anyway. This may not be 100% exact, but again, this is just a garden fence. So good enough was, well, good enough. The process for the second layer was nearly identical to the first, except for the necessary addition of two ladders. So we started by stapling one end, then the other, and then as much as we could reach on each of the posts in between. Once again, we overlapped the chicken wire, this time by five inches, and after everything was freestanding, I used the ladder to add the rest of the staples all the way to the top. Again, repeat three more times, and our entire fence was complete. All that was left was to trim off any excess and add some extra staples to make sure everything stayed together. However, as you can see, we still had one rather major security flaw, and judging by these small claw marks, I'd say that some critters were quick to take advantage. So the next step was to begin sewing the three layers together, and for that we used some of this 19 gauge stainless steel wire, as it matched the fencing and should hopefully also stand up to the elements. 
This part was pretty easy, but after 400 feet of sewing, we found that the easiest method was to have one person inside the fence and one on the outside. Then, by just feeding the wire back and forth, progress was pretty quick. Alternatively, we found that it was just about as fast for one person once we thought to use one of these large curved upholstery needles. This really helped to feed the wire back and forth without another pair of hands. Oh, and we also found it easiest to sew in small sections, in our case just from one post to the next, and then tie it off, because trying to pull the wire any farther than that simply added too much resistance and everything kept jamming up. Now, we finished the sewing by the end of last season, and so by now we can confirm that no hungry deer have made it into our garden, and no raccoons have been able to tear the fencing apart or pull it down from the poles. But unfortunately, there's still nothing stopping them from simply climbing over it. And that's what we'll be talking about in part four. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.